My name is, name is Michael Eager. I'm the uh, local secretary, the president of San Francisco Regional Mensa. Want to welcome you to our speaker series. Uh, our speaker today is Adam Brand in London, who acts as a forensic handwriting examiner in civil cases. That's where proof is based on the balance of probability, not in criminal cases where guilt is beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, he is the past chairman of the British Institute of Graphologists, works for companies recruiting new employees for lawyers, assessing questions, signatures, and we're going to get a, um, an outline of what a graphologist is, whether the subject is a science or a myth, and maybe not a myth, um, and tell us what um, signatures tell about people. So here is our speaker, Adam Brand. Good afternoon, Thank you very much. everybody. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, a situation whereby what do graphologists examine? Then I want to look at stroke, which is the ductus, the line of ink. And then, um, as Michael said, is it a scientific subject? And then what is the meaning of signatures? Now, why look at just two things? This is an enormous subject, but I just want to give you a feel of the sort of things that we do as graphologists. Now, if you look at these two documents, they were both written by the same person. The writing on the left was written by a man who had hands. The writing on the right was written by the same man without hands. He had prosthetic hands. And this is um, Leo Kelts, who was an Austrian policeman who had his hands blown off. Now, why have I put this particular um, example up? It's to stress the fact that your handwriting is brain writing. Now, that's a pretty obvious thing, but some people say, well, my handwriting's changed. I've done a lot of gardening. My hands are, are playing up. But in fact, you graphologically write the same way with your hands, your mouth, your feet, and even if you're flying a plane and writing in the sky, graphologically, there is consistency there. Now, what is the reason that graphologists think that graphology works? It's the empathy with shapes that impress us, lead us to use similar forms to express our feelings. Now, there were studies in the States um, across a large number of groups where these individuals were asked, where would you put the word march? Would you put it under the angular vertical structure or under the more horizontal curve structure? And within um, way beyond chance, up to 83.5%, everybody agreed that march, red, acid, chlorine, hot, aggression, fire, went under the vertical angular angle structure and the other words went up against the, uh, the the more curved horizontal structure. So that's basically the background to graphology. If you ask anybody in the world, please write a line which is optimistic. That line tends to go upwards. If you ask them to write a slightly depressing line, that right writing will go and the line will go downwards. So that is a fundamental basis of graphology. Now, what do graphologists examine? They look at the movement of the writing, how you express yourself. They look at the layout. This is how you organize yourself. And what we're talking about layout, we're talking about the distance between the letters, the distance between the words, the distance between the lines, the margins. Uh, you look at the form. Now, most people think that graphology is the shape of letters. It's not as important as you might think but it does tell you how you present yourself. If somebody has very florid, complicated writing, they tend to be very talkative. If it's simplified, they're more likely to get straight to the point. Then we look at the zones of the writing. All um, writing has three zones. I mean, this is not true in China, which has got nine squares and so on, but Latin cursive, you have three zones. Now, what are the zones? The middle zone is the M's, the N's and the vowels. And the upper zone is the top of the THs, Ls, and so on. The lower zone, the bottom, the YGs and Zs. Um, where you put your emphasis, either with pressure or size, gives a feeling to where the focus of that individual is. Uh, the upper zone is more uh, 
is sort of abstract, the middle zone is more social, the lower zone is more practical, materialistic. Then the one I want to look at is stroke. Because if you can see the amount of things that a graphologist look at, it is an enormous subject. So I just want to focus in on stroke for the simple reason that if you catch somebody's um, shopping list, you can have a quick look at the stroke and that can tell you something about them. Now, stroke tells you something about how you are within yourself. Doctors use it for checking on cancer, potential heart problems. Uh, sometimes you might have Parkinson's developing. I'm not going to be looking at the medical side of stroke. I'm going to be looking at the personality side of stroke. So I'll be looking mainly at stroke and signatures to give you a feel for what this subject's all about if you've not been involved with graphology uh, yourself. Now stroke. You look at the width to get a degree of sensual response. You look at the borders to get a degree that response is under control. And you look at pressure to get a feeling for the creative force that is available to the person. Now, if we first look at the broad description of stroke, graphologists call this um, either pasty or sharp. And by pasty, what we mean is somebody who holds the pen as if it was more like a paintbrush. It's quite a long hold of the pen. Um, the width is, uh, of the actual stroke is likely to be more than about 0.32 of a millimeter. It's light pressured and the up and down strokes have the same thickness. Now, the qualities of a person who writes like this is as follows. I'm going to be talking about context quite a lot. Um, I, I, it's a very complicated uh, area of, of graphology, but basically it's looking at whether it's an imaginative writing well laid out and so on. So you tend to say that's in a positive context and you can be relatively positive in your conclusions. Um, those of you who may have done industrial engineering or work study will know that when you're timing somebody in a factory, you have a feeling that they're either working at four miles an hour, which is relatively positive, or they're walking at two miles an hour, which is relatively negative, and you take that into account. Now with graphology, th this is a similar situation where you have high form standard and low form standard. So when I use this term positive context, that's what I'm talking about. So somebody who's got this pasty type of stroke, easy going, relies on senses, craves intensity, negative, too wide and blurry, unclear judgment, likely to drain their irritation by escaping into smoking alcohol and drugs. Now, one of the most um, interesting examples of pasty writing is Prince Charles. Um, pasty writers have pleasure in colors and Prince Charles is a water watercolor painter. Um, they're artistic. Prince Charles plays the cello. They have a desire to be different. And we all know about Prince Charles and his uh, willingness to talk to flowers. Um, it's also have a slight self emphasis. And you see that again with this somewhat left slant at the beginning here as well. And of course, this was a problem for Prince Charles because I think he had a slight uh, issue with Princess Diana who was the center of everybody's attention uh, and he wasn't. Um, they have a yearning for exciting pleasures. And of course, this is why Prince Charles was known as Action Man when he was younger. He was skiing, water skiing, jumping out of planes with a parachute, uh, flying planes. I think he crashed a plane. So he was known as Action Man when he was younger. And they're very tactile. They have a need for bodily contact. Now, when we look at the situation which is um, more negative, you have a very blurred stroke. Here is somebody with very strong sensory response. Um, there's a tendency towards addiction. This person smokes about 40 cigarettes a day and is a, a borderline alcoholic. Now, when we talk about the other type, and I'm being very broad in my definitions here, we're talking about sharp writing. Now, a sharp per writing person is somebody who has a the angle of the pen is at nearer to 90 degrees to the surface of the paper. Uh, a rather short grip, they might hold the pen nearer the point. Now, when they write narrow loops, those loops are not filled with ink, um, which is not the case with a pasty writer. It often it is filled with ink. 
the width is less than 0.28 of a millimeter and the end strokes thin out. Now the qualities of a person like this in a positive context, self-disciplined, intellectual, sensitive or refined, negative context, often when the pressure is quite heavy, cold, harsh, unable to relax or enjoy things. Now here's one that's relatively positive. It's somebody who has an intellectual orientation. Uh, the quality of experience means more than quantity. Um, they're more naturally refined than a pasty writer. Uh, vibrant colors, uh, vulgarity, disorder um, can affect them negatively. So that's what you see when you get a feeling for that slightly sharp stroke. You see that uh, ending that's slightly pointed. Now, the borders of the stroke. If the width of the stroke gives you a, a, an idea of the degree of sensual response, the border of the stroke gives you a degree those responses are under control. Now, what we are talking about here is contraction and release, that somebody is very controlled, very contracted, you have very straight borders. Um, where somebody is more released, the border is a bit more fuzzy. Now, I've got a lovely sample here. Look at this. Here is somebody who is uh, very controlled. I mean, uh, there are lots of things going on in this writing which are fascinating. I mean, for instance, there's a lot of overlapping of lines. Here's somebody who's trying to ward off unrecognized fears. But what I want to look at is that stroke. Um, here's somebody hiding in a, um, one of these London livery companies. Um, it founded in 1395, but I can't remember which one it is. Now look at this stroke close up, quite smooth, controlled. Now this one is different. This is the um, writing of a, of a pilot. He was a, a Spitfire pilot during the war, very much more relaxed type of writing. When you look at his stroke, you've got a slightly fuzzy, slightly porous on the right, slightly more um, tight on the left. So here's somebody with a flexible attitude to the environment, a balance between control and, and expression of sensual response. So immediately, just by looking at uh, a few millimeters of a stroke, you're getting a feel for somebody. Now, very importantly is pressure, the pressure of the stroke, the, uh, the weight of the pen into the paper. Now, when you look at pressure, it's giving you an idea of the creative force available for productive work. And if it's very heavy pressure in a positive environment, you've got willpower, tenacity, emotional intensity. If it's negative, you're likely to see somebody where his pressure is more than average, it's far too much. So you tend to feel that you're in the presence of somebody who's egotistical, stubborn, crude, brutal. Now, measuring pressure is quite difficult because a lot of the stuff that I do for companies comes through as um, email attachments and it's very difficult to see the pressure. For instance, how can you tell the pressure of this writing? If you get the original, you can turn it over and you can see the pressure coming through the back. So ideally, when one's doing quite a detailed job for a company, ideally one wants to actually hold the original document. That's often not the case, by the way but it does help. Now, pressure, when it's light, is somebody who is mentally agile, adaptable and alert, negatively can be oversensitive, impressionable and weak-willed. Now, I have got the most remarkable writing here. If you look at this writing and you look just at the shapes, look at the power of this writing pulling down into the lower zone. Look at those underlining. Look at the tenacity in those hooks. Look at the emotional, the, the, the mental enthusiasm of that long T-bar. Look at this L down here, which is pulling the pen towards the body, the sort of determination that showed. The only thing is, this writing is incredibly light. It was written on very light paper. It took a lot of time to actually reproduce it so that I could show it to you. It's incredibly delicate. Now, what does this mean? What it means is you've got somebody with strong intentions, as you can see from the shape of the letters, but with very little willpower to support those intentions. That is why pressure is so important, because you can misread a writing by just looking at the shapes. Now, normal pressure control is when you have a situation where heavy down, light up, and is relatively vertical. Now here we have somebody 
who's got willpower that's available, they have emotional sympathy for their fellow human being, and they have strength for uh, productive activity. So that's a positive standard, uh, and all of you will have this sort of uh, pressure pattern. Now, uncontrolled pressure in a, a positive environment is somebody is easily influenced by impressions or negatively can be mentally disturbed um, and has problems. Now, here's an example of that. If you look at the variation of pressure, you've got to be very careful that this person isn't writing with a leaky pen. So it's very important that you check that it's not the instrument causing the problem, that no matter what instrument this person picks up, they have this very strange pressure pattern. Then you have a situation with pressure which is over-controlled. You have a thing called displaced pressure. And here we have a displaced pressure. These, believe it or not, are two T's, um, very open T's. But look at the pressure. It's on the upstroke, not on the downstroke. So here we have somebody in a positive environment who's excited by ideas. The upper zone is where the abstract, the ideas, the imagination can be uh, seen. On the other hand, it can be somebody demanding attention. Then in the middle zone, this is an M, you have pressure on the upstroke when it should be um, light and on downstroke it should be heavy. And here you have somebody who can be a bit of a perfectionist or can force issues on people. Then you have a situation in the lower zone. This is an F. This is the lower part of an F. And you can see the pressure is on the upstroke when it should be on the downstroke. Now, here you have a situation where somebody has this tremendous need to attain. Quite a lot of people who are ambitious. You look at this and you find that this displaced pressure is forcing them upwards when it should be in the opposite direction. And it can be a sign of over, overly aggressive uh, behavior as well. You sometimes see this with a Y that shoots off to the right at an angle and lifts up aggressively. So this gives you a feeling for a, a key aspect of graphology, which is the stroke. But what I want to concentrate now is to answer the question about, is it a scientific subject? Now, uh, you men's people will know all about the scientific method. I am totally for it. Um, you know, Karl Popper and his null hypothesis and all the rest of it. A hypothesis is generated to describe how a dependent variable depends on the independent variable. An experiment is designed to manipulate independent variable and measure the dependent variable. And if the data shows the relationship between variables is statistically significant, then the hypothesis is true we hope, and you can test it again. Now, the problem is with graphology, scientists say that it's lacking in validity, it's lacking in reliability. On the validity side, the interpretations are subjective. Um, on the reliability side, there can be disagreement between graphologists. Uh, by the way, um, top graphologists, the one in Israel, I don't think that applies at all. They are absolutely outstanding. Um, so I think when some of these tests have been done, they've been done on graphologists who aren't particularly well trained. So you're not actually testing the subject, you're testing the person. But finally, you have the really brutal um, attack on graphology, which is the Barnum effect. Now, this is the circus band, Barnum and Bailey. The Barnum effect means that a graphologist will write a very positive report about somebody and that person will receive that report and say graphology really works it's a very good scientific subject because look what it says about me it says i'm a nice intelligent super person well it must be right because that's exactly what i am now of course all the things i've said uh, can be attacked now bernstein in canada has said look if graphology is going to be in line with the scientific method. I've got the ideal hypothesis for graphology. Now, this is the hypothesis that I suggest. Handwriting that slants to the right by at least X degrees is correlated to a personality tray T, where X is a precise number, T is a measurable tray, and you can then measure whether the condition is satisfied or not. And if the hypothesis in one is true, that gives a prediction that can be tested. Now, we have a situation where 
Roland Mergel at the University of Munich actually did this. He ran an experiment and hopefully it was done in line with the scientific method. And here was his conclusion. It is statistically significant that there is an association between the tray of agreeableness and slow speed of handwriting. Now here is something that is acceptable science. It has met the scientific method and this is the conclusion for future testing. Now the only trouble is that this is not graphology. Graphologists know that slow writing is a sign of concealment an intent to disguise, likely to be person very predictable, inflexible. When I'm doing forensic work and it's very slow, it's the first thing I look at. Is this person disguising something? Are they trying to avoid responsibility? And then irritability. You can pick up irritability in handwriting by uh, forward T bars. You can have temper ticks that are all over the place. You can have um, eye dots that are angular. Um, now, irritability rather than agreeableness is when the person is, is faced with quicker thinking individuals. I'm being plagued by an ant. Excuse me a second. We're having a mini heat wave in the UK. Um, so what this is saying is that science is saying one thing, but graphologists disagree with the science. Um, the reason for this is that scientists want to be able to say this means that. Graphologists are taught in their very first lesson, you never say this means that. Um, and the reason for that is that writing has a plurality of meanings. There's high or low form standard, which I've tried to explain, whereby if it's very low form standard, it has a different meaning. Large writing can be uh, a positive or arrogant in low form standard and so on. Each graphic science sign is nuanced by another. You have to evaluate a whole mass of different aspects before you draw a conclusion. When you're writing a report for companies, you're in fact writing poetry. Every single word can count. So you cannot take one variable and keep the other stable. Now, what does this mean? It means that scientific graphology, something that is satisfactory and acceptable to science, is a list of disjointed but repeatable and testable traits. But graphologists say this is bad graphology. Now, the issue is that good graphology is bad science. So my conclusion here is that we're not talking about science. We're talking about a useful art, because I do believe in the scientific method as being the test for science. But look at what you can do with graphology. Take angles and light pressure. Here is um, one or two, three or four, um, what are known as counter-dominants. And there are 50, 60, 100 counter dominance. Angles and light pressure. Angles means an aggressive mode of reasoning. Light pressure means somebody lacking the stomach for the fight. Large absolute size and light pressure. Large absolute size, attention seeking, ambitious, but without the drive to achieve ambitions. Right slant and narrowness. Narrowness means when the an end, for instance, is um, quite narrow at the base uh, versus its height. So here we have somebody right slant, desire for extroversion, but anxiety over involvement. So he's very selective in their friendships. Right slant and wide words and wide lines, desire to interrelate matched by an equal unconscious need to remain isolated. And then we're getting on to signatures and I'm not gonna be doing this. I'm not gonna be looking at uh, the actual text, but there is a marked difference between signature and text. So what you've got is a difference between the public and private behavior. Now, this is very important when you're recruiting people because you have people who write enormous signatures. So they're making a marvelous presentation on themselves. They do very well in interview. Yet when the writing is sent to me, I see this wonderful large signature, but the writing itself is small, left slant, disconnected, wide word spacing. So here this person is acceptable as being a fantastic salesman. Look at his performance at interview. Look at his wonderful signature. Actually, it's a total facade. So it's this counterbalancing of uh, that you can look at with graphology that you can't get in other systems. I mean, for instance, Mars-Briggs, which I've got a lot of time for, you tend to be put in a box. And even that 
doesn't stay in a box after you've had a psychological investigation and, and test, those letters that you get may move around. So even Myers-Briggs, which have, uh, has got this enormous database, may have scientific issues. Now, clearly there are scientific issues with graphology, therefore I have to conclude it does not match the scientific method. Nonetheless, it is an extremely useful skill that I think can bring uh, a, a lot of uses. Now, if you look at what um, Pervin has said in the book Personality Theory and Research, he has made the point personality is not merely a physical system. Psychologists have been warned against importing the physical sciences into the study of human meaning systems. Listing the psychological parts of a person lead, may leave one lacking a holistic understanding of the individual and the developmental processes that contributed to his or her uniqueness. Now, this man is not a graphologist, but I think one would very much agree that that is true, that the thing about graphology is we use um, typology in the sense of Freud and Jung and Maslow uh, and so on to get a feeling for the type, but the graphologist can go in and look at the individual aspects within that typology. And that's why it is such a useful um, art as I call it. Now, what I want to do is to uh, give you a little taste for what you can do just looking at signatures. Now, the reason I picked on signatures is in the modern world of iPads, it's about the only thing you often see of a person's writing. Um, as I said, you may be able to pick up a shopping list, which will help you if you can look at the stroke, but it's signatures that you tend to see. Therefore, I want to concentrate on signatures to give you a feel for what um, graphology is all about. Now, I'm going to look at signatures on their own. Normally with uh, work done with uh, companies in terms of pre-interview screening, we get cursive writing and signatures, but I'm just looking at the signatures on their own. I'm looking at their symbolism, size, the zonal uh, pressure, the legibility, the relationship between names, uh, line, underlining baselines and endings. Now, having said that, one has got to be very cautious about signatures on their own. Clara Roman, who's a very famous graphologist, said signatures develop earlier and settle sooner than the handwriting proper and they do not always keep step with the course of maturation. Now you'll find this with men, they may be practicing their signature right up you know, they may settle down at about 17 or 18, say, right, that's my signature. They may stick with that signature for the rest of their life. However, graf graphic maturity does not arrive until a person is about 21. So the signature um, may settle down sooner and therefore could possibly be misread. So one has got to be very careful. Nonetheless, what you've got with a signature is a facade, the way you wish to present yourself but you do see hidden aspects, sometimes creative qualities. You also see with changing signatures, it tells you about what's going on with the personality. Now, let us start with symbolism. When you're looking at a signature, the first thing you look for is what is the main symbolism that's hitting you. For instance, is it circles, squares, triangles, or threads? Now, circles, here is a, an example of a television personality, uh, Cheryl Cole in this country, very circular type of signature. Circles, the symbolism here is love. So here we have loving person who seeks approval, maybe manipulative. They like comfort, they like time for their fr friends. They dislike conflict, being alone, making quick decisions. Now, if you're negotiating with somebody who's got one of these circular signatures, they want to decide whether they like you as an individual, whether they, you know, they, they, they need to be given time. They can't be rushed into anything when you're negotiating with them. Now, squares, here we have uh, General Montgomery of North Africa, very square type writing. Um, this is all about security. 
logical, practical, not idealistic, likes procedures, details, not uh, delegating. By the way, that's often the case with an underlying signature that you see here. Now, the thing we know about General Montgomery, which was um, very important to the UK before uh, the states got involved, was the fact that he was incredibly detailed. He was not going to attack before he had everything lined up. And that's what a, a square type person um, is likely to be. And when you're negotiating with them, you've got to make certain that you give them information. You cannot con somebody like this. They want information. Triangles. Then, of course, we've got Trump, who's the classic triangle writer. Do you realize that Trump was in graphology textbooks over 30 years ago? He's always been an absolutely classic uh, signature, even before he was um, in politics. Now, obviously, we know a lot about Trump, but people who write like this are naturally aggressive, um, positively decisive, ambitious, negatively destructive, self-centered, likes the top floor, doesn't like wishy-washy people, and negotiation, you've got to get going. You can't start trying to be friendly with people like Trump. He just wants you to get on with it and do it. Um, so so it's, it's absolutely clear. And of course, we have his friend. Now, that's an unfair point. I pull that point back. We have somebody similar in, uh, in Putin with his angles. Now, threads is another thing that you look at, the symbolism of threads. This is Boris Johnson, very thready writing. You can see that there's no clear structure. And thready people like to be uh, very creative, intuitive. They reject routine. They like freedom, thinking on their feet. They don't like being organized and they're open to discussion. I mean, Boris Johnson has the um, example of being stuck on a high wire, having to uh, wave two Union Jacks. Uh, he's one of the few people that can think in a situation, what do I do? It's so stupid. I'm absolutely stuck up here and carrying it off. Most politicians would be overwhelmed with embarrassment. He's got that ability to think on his feet and come up with a joke uh, and carry on. Though this problem of um, freedom is an issue whereby he will often, uh, you know, be two-sided for a long time. And there's a classic case with Brexit. He wrote a, an essay for both sides before he plumped for going for Brexit. So freedom is very important to somebody who has this thready type of writing. Now, I want to look at absolute size. I find this absolutely fascinating absolute size. The reason is the Harvard Business Review um, looked at absolute size. Now, these people in the Harvard Business Review, which I rate as the best business magazine in the world, were not graphologists, yet they looked at the absolute size of chief executive officers, and they found that they large writing uh, authors spent a lot of money on R&D acquisition capital goods, but were lacking in innovation. They had poor sales growth uh, between three to six years. Now, their summary and how they did this uh, is quite interesting, was that these people who wrote with these large signatures were narcissistic, dominated discussions, ignored criticism, belittled employees, and got higher pay because they're able to shift blame. Now, the people they picked, the whole mass in this article, if you track it down, whereby you have Rupert Murdoch, very large writing, business not doing very well. Um, Bruce Chisholm, very small writing, business doing very well. I, I quite frankly, I find this quite astonishing that the Harvard Business Review, which I really rate, could have picked on white one item because as I told you, graphologists never say this means that. This article says this means that. Basically, I think if you have a CEO who's got large um, signature, be careful, don't invest in this company. I mean, I find it quite astonishing that um, the editors would, would allow this to go through because you might have a situation with a large writing person in a rapidly growing market that is rapidly growing. It might have grown a bit more if you haven't had these problems, but picking on this one item is quite interesting. But nonetheless, it does give you an indication that non-graphologists have a feeling that size tells you something. Now, changing size, the situation here is with a personality, you can have a situation whereby the signature gets larger. Here is Mussolini becoming El Duce. Um, and you see the size getting bigger. Then you have Galileo. 
where the size is getting smaller. Now, the top one was written in 1610, where he said, God has pleased me by means of a lens to make me the first observer of marvelous things unrevealed to bygone ages. So you've got this lovely signature. 1633, the Inquisition has got hold of him, and this is the bottom signature. He then writes, I maintained that the sun is the center of the world and immovable. I detest the aforesaid errors and heresies. And look at that collapse. Now, the, the classic situation, of course, is Nixon going through Watergate, where his self-esteem uh, is clearly disappearing. So you can tell from the changing size of the signature quite a lot. Now, the other thing you could look at is zonal proportions. Now, what I mean by zonal proportions is upper zone is there, middle zone is the uh, uh, vowels and the ends and so on as I explained, and the lower zone is the bottom. Now, when you stress one zone against another, if you're stressing the upper zone, which is the abstract area, or the middle zone, which is the emotional here and now area, or the lower zone, which is a physical uh, and materialistic area, it tells you something about a person's interests. This is um, a tall upper zone. Now with a tall upper zone, you've got this abstract imagination, and this is Prince Philip. Now, people think of Prince Philip as a, a bit of an action man. He rode, he played polo and so on. But people forget he was an extremely original man with tremendous imagination. He wrote 14 books. He had an enormous library at Windsor Castle, incredibly well-educated man. And you get a feel, and it's a bit of a shock when you see his writing and it's got this massive upper zone. Then you have a large middle zone where you have both narrow and wide writing. I picked on narrow because it shows a very headstrong, stubborn person who's got quite a lot of scorn for others. A bit, bit of a, I'm afraid, a bit of Trump in here. Um, quite a remarkable signature, this, uh, which you, I'm afraid you immediately have to say, I'm sorry, uh, there are low form standard problems here. Then you have a long lower zone, which is about uh, the physical material side, where you have somebody who's involved in many projects, uh, needs for variety and lots of sensations. Now, I went to a prep school in Ohio, and this is one of the headmasters there. I remember going back to a school reunion, and he was in a board meeting. He saw us all standing outside looking around. He said excuse me to his fellow colleagues. He rushed out of the office, and he showed us around all the new buildings he'd been putting up since we left. And it absolutely sums up his character with that lower zone. You remember I talked about displaced pressure. If you look at this upper zone, look at the way it comes around and it gives you this massive increase in pressure. Now, this is only a copy, but you can see it actually on this uh, transparency here. So here is somebody who has a tremendous need to attain and you see it, it's a, it's a classic example of lower zone stressed writing. Now, legibility is very important. Um, when you have somebody who's got very legible writing, very copybook writing, and copybook means they're in line with the, the way they were taught at school, you have something like this. Now, Joe Swindon is the past leader of the Liberal Democrats in this country. Um, and when you have this legible writing, it's immediately you sense somebody who is considerate, punctual, orderly, conventional, but there's a problem here. They may have a strong sense of duty, but they lack an original approach. They're just a solid good person, and I'm afraid that was recognized and she lost her seat. Then you have a very illegible signature, and here you have a situation where somebody's very self-protective, uh, does not want to be recognized, um, hates to be nailed down, and can possibly be deceitful. Uh, and he has Madoff's signature. Now, the interesting thing is here, if Madoff had his signature analyzed by graphologists, they would made it pretty clear, do not invest in this Ponzi scheme, the man is trouble. Um, because you can immediately pick up something with that signature. Now, the next thing about signatures you look at is the relationship between names. 
The given name, the first name, is the intimate part of the ego. It, it shows childhood feelings. The surname is the social ego, the adult role. So where the stress is, it gives you some idea of the person. If the first name is larger, uh, possibly more legible, you've got somebody who's approachable, direct, friendly. That's the impression they want to give. If the surname is more pronounced, then you have the more social adult role coming into action, a more reserved person that you're seeing. And then if you have the names the same size, you have balanced harmony between the private and the social roles. Now, if you look at the first name being larger, you've got Joe Biden. Now you might say to me, ah, but the Joe is obviously bigger than the B because J goes into the lower zone. But on the other hand, look at the height above the B. That is a massive great J. Look at the second name larger where you have with um, Indira Gandhi, where you've got the G, a massive G in relation to the height of the middle zone. Again, you might say, ah, oh, but G has got a lower zone. Nonetheless, that is stressed that surname is the important signature. So you have the social role uh, becoming more dominant. Then you have names all the same size, and here you have Hillary Clinton, where the names are relatively the same size, and that means that there's a balanced harmony between the private and social roles. Now, uh, you uh, Mensa people uh, quickly pick up the fact that the R looks slightly bigger than the C, and I must admit that there's truth in that, but basically they're all the same. Maybe um, she wrote this when she was having trouble with Clinton and stressing her maiden name, I don't know. But you get the idea that this is what you're looking for in signatures. Now, another thing that you look for in signatures is underlining. If you don't have an underlining, it means that the person who is signing uh, doesn't necessarily need to make their presence known. They're just there, okay? With a positive signature, it means somebody who wants to be recognized, but not necessarily in an excessive way. Here's, a, here's an example of that. Um, it's a nice undesign. The writing's not very big. You've got quite a strong D, and that's relatively positive. The problem is, if you have an underlining with a rather negative signature, here's a, a small, declining, awkward, lower bit of paper right on the bottom left-hand side. So here is somebody who wants to appear more assertive uh, than he actually is. You can have curved underlining. Underlines are known as paraphs. And I have to show you this because I think this one is quite astonishing. This is a prime minister in the UK uh, in the 19th century, Disraeli, who wrote uh, novels and so on. This absolutely sums up, in my opinion, what a superb person he was. If you look at that curve, it's a sign of wit. It's called trisonal dynamics when you have that change of direction. A ironic wit, which he had. Look at the E of Disraeli, close, diplomatic. Look at the incredibly dynamic structure of that S. Look at the high I dots, um, very curious. I mean, this man was absolutely brilliant, but I want to concentrate on the underlining, just, just the underlining, that superb, curved, ironic, witty individual. He must have been an incredibly impressive person. And of course, this is what you get with um, graphology that you can't get with a, a questionnaire. You can look at the personality of somebody who's dead, because obviously we can't give Disraeli a questionnaire to fill in for a, a Mars Briggs. Um, and therefore you can get a feeling for historical figures from their handwriting. Uh, that's why, um, you know, graphologists are so sad that everybody's typing everything now. Now, multiple underlining, the classic here is um, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, multiple underlining is usually pretty negative. It means overbearing, obtrusive, egocentric, rather window dressing uh, to impress people. And the one we know quite well is Disraeli, but it's going on even in the modern era. I had this one uh, only last week. Now, underlining to the left and connected to the name, this is somebody who shields against outside forces. They hide aspects of their personal sphere within four walls. And the classic here is Prince William, where you've got that switch back. Um, 
so that, interestingly, uh, Kate has got lovely right slanted writing and he has no problems with her going into a crowd, shaking hands and being very popular. Um, he's not like Prince Charles, who's got that uh, slight need for being the center of attention. Then you've got a, a circular stroke. When you put a circle around a signature, it's a, it's a magical circle. Um, I use that uh, carefully because people are suspicious about graphology, thinking it's, it's a myth. But there is a magical element to putting a circle around the sea. You're, you're trying to protect yourself from any scrutiny, from the left, the right, the top, the bottom. And in fact, you're always sensing ill will. And therefore, you may pro project that ill will onto other people, as, as Freud would say. And uh, a good example of this is Verdi. Now, here is one of the most famous opera writers in history, 24 operas, and yet look at those circles around his, his signature. Even his photographs look a bit suspicious. Maybe he was hurt early on by critics, and he's been rather self-protective ever since. Now, another thing that happens to signatures, oh, here's another one. This is a one that I had recently that's modern that shows people are still circling their names. Um, Another thing that happens with signatures is that people cross out their name. And when you have somebody who crosses out their name, it's meaning negative feelings towards the self. Because after all, a signature is, is your uh, public presentation. So you may want to become a totally different person. You may not know exactly what you want. So if you're interviewing somebody and you see a, a signature with a circle around it, uh, it's a red flag, and that's what companies uh, need graphology for. They want to know what the red flags are. What are the problems of this person? Because um, if you ask for uh, a testimonial from a previous company, they're not going to give you anything that bad, uh, but the signature and the writing can immediately give you red flags, and circles are a bit of a red flag. Um, here's the, a classic cross out, Lord Byron. Even he was trying to dress up in, in an odd way and be somebody else. Uh, here's a modern crossing out, and I expect a, a lot of you have seen these crossing out. Um, so it's a problem with, with the signature. Now, baselines, baselines are the imaginary line under the signature. They can either rise, straight, or fall, and um, it tells you something about how people plan and achieve their aims. If it's a straight baseline, it's somebody who's level-headed and, and gets things done. And the classic here is Thomas Edison, a wonderfully straight baseline. You know, he vetted the light bulb, he did everything. I mean, I know he's been accused of stealing patents and so on, but he got things done. When his factory was burnt down, he got it rebuilt. A very positive person, very straight, clear lines. Then when the baseline is falling, it can be somebody who's feeling a bit discouraged, may find it difficult to work under pressure. And I'm afraid to have to show you uh, is Queen Elizabeth, because, um, you know, she's had some tough times with Meghan and Prince Andrew, and some of her signatures now are falling. I think your photograph doesn't uh, do her many um, favours, does it? And that signature tells you that uh, when she signed it, there was an element of discouragement. Now, obviously, these baselines can change. Often people have a baseline that's falling when they come back from holiday and they've had a super time. They're absolutely exhausted um, and that baseline may straighten out. Now, another baseline is a rising baseline where you've got somebody who's ambitious, positive, focuses on doing things constructively and wants to accomplish things. Always a very positive thing. Always look for rising baselines, you're dealing with a positive, optimistic, good, uh, good worker who wants to make a contribution. Here's Churchill when he was a lieutenant in the Fourth Hussars. Now, another quick little point I wanted to show you is some people correct their signatures. This is Che Guevara. I, I find this quite astonishing because Che Guevara signed the banknotes in Cuba. And when you have a correction like this, it's quite unusual because what it's saying is trying to cover up character deficiencies, slightly calculating. Um, so it's interesting that all the things that he got up to when he signed his name, there was a little attempt to uh, cover up those deficiency. Now, I'd like to finish um, my talk with endings. And first of all, I'd like to look at a rear admiral 
in uh, an American Rear Admiral, uh, Bird, because obviously he's a famous man in your country, but it's quite astonishing that his ending is this classic left turn, which I'm afraid is not a good sign. It's egotistical, wants to obtain, slightly inconsiderate. He was determined. He had a number of tries. He pulled his team together and they did it again. And that, that slightly egotistical um, quality, uh, one has to watch when you see it in a signature because it's, uh, it's not a particularly good context. But anyhow, here is somebody who wanted things from himself and he, he, made, he was made a rear admiral. So uh, he, he, he made it as far as he was concerned. A straight long ending. Here we have the famous actress Ingrid Bergman, who has this wonderful D, this powerful D, this lovely right slant. You think I'm going to go and chat to Ingrid Bergman. And then you see this signature, this arm, the symbolic arm that comes out that is virtually saying, please leave me alone. You can see the symbolism, keep your distance. And then far, a final bit of the, uh, the signature, when you're looking at forensic uh, handwriting, it's always the last bit that matters. The first bit of writing or a signature is consciously made. The last bit of a signature or writing is more unconsciously made. Therefore, it's the most important thing that you're looking at because this is when the character comes through. And I'm afraid that the final lifted back above the middle zone um, shows an excessive need for attention. Uh, a person like this wants to attract notice at any cost. They are unable to appreciate their self-worth um, is adequate. Regardless of the amount of attention, they always feel a sense of depri deprivation. So this final lifted back above the middle zone is symbolically an arm that's waving, look at me, look after me. And I'm afraid the classic here uh, is Meghan Markle. And we know what she's been up to recently. Now, a heavy final stroke ending in the lower zone is a wonderful sign of somebody who insists on having their own way. They like to have the last word in an argument and they enjoy lecturing others. And the classic we always use here is Queen Victoria. Look at the walloping end to that signature. You don't have to look at the pressure. You can see the way that that uh, pen opens up with the pressure that she's put in that last that last bit. Now, that's all I want to say about signatures, but a comment that's always right, uh, arisen, will graphologists be looking at signatures in the future? I think the answer is yes, because we now have digitized signatures, whereby you can have um, the signature tracked over time, you can check its whole massive issues about it, the pressure, the speed, the stroke, uh, and you can look at it from uh, on the XY axis, and forgery is easy to detect. So I see digitized signatures as being extremely useful, and therefore it'll stay with us. And therefore my conclusion about all this is handwriting, handwritten signatures will last into the future. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Uh, we have quite a number of questions. Um, if you unshare your screen there, um, I'll start. Um, we have a lot of questions. Uh, first one is, uh, does it make a difference if somebody is right-handed or left-handed? Several people ask this. Uh, no, it doesn't affect it. You have to be careful because a left-handed person, when they're writing a T, tends to put the stroke for the crossbar, they start it on the right-hand side. Therefore, the pressure is greater on the right-hand side than the left. Now, the point is that if you're right-handed and the T-bar increases in pressure, um, it means that you can have somebody who's got a, a, a slightly brutal uh, problem. So if you see that pressure on the right-hand side, it raises a question. Has this person got a brutal tendency. So you have to look at other things to check that they're left-handed. Um, for instance, they may have no other brutal signs at all. They may have a slightly falling baseline and therefore you can pick up that they're slightly left-handed. But do not think that left-handed people always write with a left slant. <clears throat> left-handed people are about 11% of the population and there's a greater percentage of left-handed people turn the paper around to write with a right slant rather than a left slant. Um, 
slant, uh, you, the way they, they hold the pen tells you something about their brain structure, because um, if they are pushing their pen, they tend to have a right uh, brain dominance. If they're dragging, it tends to be left brain dominance. So you can tell things, but fundamentally, the same graphological rules apply to a left-handed or right-hand person. Yeah, Lindy asks uh, uh, that she read that you can change your personality by changing your handwriting uh, to become uh, right larger, to become a more confident person. What do you think about that? Yes, uh, this is a very strong philosophy in France, which is a very strong area for graphology. Um, it's called grapho, um, you know, uh, graphotherapy. And the point about graphotherapy is that it's basically um, auto uh, in, in the sense that you are writing out positive sentences, but they do concentrate on one or two things. There are, there are slight suspicion about this. The classic thing in graphotherapy is raising the T-bar. Um, if you have a very low T-bar, in other words, it's only just above the middle zone, it can be a sign of low self-esteem. And there was a case in France where somebody was having trouble with their husband, the husband was pushing them around. And so the graphotherapist said, why don't you spend six months rising the height raising the height of your T-bar. So over six months, she got the T-bar right to the top of the stem, and it did have an effect on her personality. And she actually went ahead and divorced her husband because she felt she had the strength of character to do that. So um, one has got to be very careful with graphotherapy. By the way, um, something has just spoken at me. Is that uh, something to do with the recording? Uh no, Judy, did you have a comment? Okay, you've come back again. Did you pick that up? Did you pick that up, that last comment I made? Yeah, but, you were just, okay, you came through just fine. So uh, basically the answer is yes, people believe in graphotherapy, but it's a very long process. Uh, Lindy asked a question, which also uh, is mine. Uh, uh, children in the US at least are not learning cursive. So I've seen a lot of people whose signature is, is a swirl of some loops. What does that mean? What can you tell from that time? Right? If you're talking about cursive against printed, um, there is a, a, a campaign in America at the moment, which is go cursive, because quite a number of uh, states, I gather, are not teaching handwriting now. Um, and therefore, they're trying to get cursive. Now, the reason for this is that some people may be taught to print, but they have a need to write in a cursive way. Now, the reason for that is that um, connected letters is a need for uh, logical thinking. Um, it, it, some people actually demand it. Other people who are taught to link their letters together don't like doing that because they're more intuitive and they break their letters up. Now, the issue is that in, uh, I think it was Mexico in 1922, there was a government edict that says all children will now print, but it caused an enormous amount of trouble because a lot of children wanted to connect. And in Canada, they've done studies whereby uh, they found that children that are taught connected letters and not printing from day one have tremendous advantages in reading, um, communication with their friends, uh, logical thinking. It's quite astonishing that to try and, uh, you know, start from printing is not as efficient as trying to start with connected letters. Um, there seems to be a tremendous advantage to teach people from day one to connect their letters together. It, have happened, it, it seems to help uh, tremendously across a whole range uh, of activities. Now, getting back to swoopy signatures, there may be somebody who feels they, they, they need to write in capital letters for clarity, but this need that for connectedness comes out in their signature. And therefore, you basically want to see the signature and their cursive writing to find out what's going on. Um, interesting. Um, Judy says that she and her husband, when they first met, their handwriting was identical. Does that mean anything? Uh, it's a very good sign. It means that if I saw both their handwriting, I would say they're going to be married for a long time because it means that they're in tune. Now, there is an issue here because um, if you have 
what, what do we mean by similar writing? Similar writing can be similar zones, similar word spacing, similar slant, similar pressure, similar rhythm. Um, so I'd have to look at a lot of things before I agreed that their writing is similar. Um, but similar writing is usually a good thing because people think on the same lines. Now, if you have people who have a husband who's got very wide word spacing and a wife that's got very close word spacing, um, I always say to them, look, the wife says, I, I can't understand. I don't think my husband is, is, is interested in me. I keep asking him to parties and he doesn't want to come. If you look at his writing, you can see that the wide word spacing is he needs space to himself. And therefore, it's nothing to do with their relationship. That is just him. So basically, if writing is similar, and I'd have to look at it to know that that's true, that's usually a good thing. The idea that opposites attract um, is slightly suspect. One would have to see what those opposites are. So I would say to Judy, um, I look forward to being at her 60th wedding anniversary. Wonderful. Uh, you talked about stroke edges and the width and uh, it. Um, I would like a very fine tip ballpoint pen. Uh, Trump reportedly likes to use a felt tip pen with a broad tip. Uh, does the choice of pen make a difference? Is, Absolutely it, likely, you... because you can actually tell about a person's personality before they've written anything at all. Um, for instance, I had to look at somebody's writing and I gave him a borrow and uh, I said, could you write me something? And he said, I'm not going to use that pen. And he produced a pen which had a very wide nib, classically soft, ideal for pasty writing. So before he'd written anything, I was able to tell him about his character. And he was quite astonished. He hadn't actually written anything because I was able to describe the characteristics of a pasty writer, which is what he was. Now, people like Trump, who like wide, fat, fiber, uh, you often see this with um, music groups that they sign their signature with black fiber tip. What that means is when you have this big wide fiber tip, what you're saying is they're somebody that wants to make a big impression without doing too much work because it's all about impact. And you see this with Trump, this massive wide writing, it's all about impact. Um, so that, uh, you know, the, the instrument you use does tell you something about people sometimes only want to use pencils. And that tells you that they don't want to commit themselves. Um, people who use very sharp pens, what we know in this country is Parker 51. It's like a sword. They like to fight the paper. So you immediately know that the type of personality you're dealing with before they've actually written anything because of the choice of pen they pick up. Valerie says that people trained in calligraphy will hold the pen uh, upright, close to 90 degrees. Does that affect their outlook? Does that make the analysis more difficult? I mean, if they are um, calligraphy by uh, temperament, and they always write like that, and Meghan Markle is a case in point, um, calligraphy writing is known as persona writing. It's facade writing, and therefore you're in creating an impression. Now, if you are a calligrapher all the time, then it's very difficult to read that person's personality because they are actually putting up a barrier. They do not want to get uh, let you get to know them. But if a calligrapher is writing calligraphy for uh, menus and cards and so on, and then you look at their ordinary writing, it's the ordinary writing that matters because calligraphy written all the time is known as, uh, as facade writing. And therefore, um, you're, you're, you're in a situation where you're going to have difficulty getting behind this barrier because they basically don't want you to get to know them. Uh, you showed a signature uh, with a middle zone, a large middle zone. Uh, Betty asks, who was that signature? Uh, <laughs> it was a local female estate agent. Okay. And I tell uh, you what, I pity the people working in her office, but I'm glad it's America that's listening to this. <laughs> Uh, Valerie asks, what are the, what's the meaning of little circles used instead of dots over an I or, or alas? It means uh, a, a wish to a be individual, okay? Um, 
it, when you have the circle eye dots, it's, it's, it's part of the, the, the loving side of things, but it usually means, especially with men, they want to be seen as individuals, they want to have a, a separate identity, they want to be seen as artistic. Um, so it's a loving artistic move. Uh, it's usually more with women than men. When you see it with men, it is men who write very normally, but suddenly they put a circle on the top of their eye and, uh, you know, they want to be seen as more artistic than, you know, you might appreciate them for. What does it mean if you uh, don't put the dot? If you have a very uh, small light dot quite close to the eye stem directly above it, uh, it's a sign of loyalty. And it's a very positive sign when you're looking at uh, uh, job applicants. Eye, eye dots are very small things, but they matter more in forensic because in forensic, the things that matter are the inconspicuous things. So when somebody is trying to forge a signature, the eye dots are often the thing they forget to get right. And it's very indicative. People tend to be unique in the way they write their eye dots. Uh, Bernie asks, has anybody analyzed signatures of the signatures of the US Declaration of Independence? over, you know, Hancock oh, I'm, had I'm a sure big they have. one. Yeah, I'm sure they have. Um, I mean, I, I actually saw Lincoln, that's not the Declaration of Independence, um, but you know, you, you have these very large signatures. What's the expression when you say, can I give you my, what's the signature, the very large signature on the Declaration? Uh, that, uh, would, that would be John Hancock's. What, what is it? Uh, put your Jan, Put your John Hancock at the bottom yes. of the page. Yes, um, John Hancock being the famous one because it's extremely large, okay? Um, so I'm sure they have all been analyzed. Um, and th there's some excellent graphologists in America. Um, I think that um, Sheila Lowe has done a lot of work in this, Pat Siegel um, also, uh, because you've got some excellent graphologists in America. Uh, they will have done that. Uh, Jim wants to know how he can obtain a, an analysis of his uh, writing from a qualified professional graphologist and what it might cost if you don't. Um, I don't know what the costs are in the States. It, in this country, it's relatively uh, cheap, depending on what you want. Uh, a full report is about $120. Um, and it can get more if it's a senior chairman because you want a more detailed analysis where you're going into m rather deeper things, which might be um, things that people don't necessarily want written in a report, like how do they get on with their parents and what happens in certain situations and so on. But a standard report where you're talking about the, the personality, social behavior, their working qualities, their mental qualities, uh, in this country is about a hundred pounds I don't know what it is in the States. I think it may be a lot more. It varies. Um, uh, doctor's handwriting is apocryphal for being illegible. Uh, Babsy wants to know, is there a reason why they have such awful handwriting? Uh, funnily enough, they've done surveys on this and they're not the worst. In this country, farmers are worse than doctors. But the classic example with doctors is if a doctor wants to meet you under the clock at one o'clock uh, and they're going to be wearing a red rose in their lapel, that will be legible because they want to communicate. The problem with doctors is high speed is often a sign of high intelligence and Therefore, they write rapidly, and that sometimes makes them illegible because they have to write a lot of um, prescriptions and so on. Um, and it has caused a tremendous amount of problems because prescriptions have been uh, wrongly read by pharmacists and chemists. And as a result of that, I believe there's been a big drive in the States that doctors should type out their prescriptions. But the reason for high speed illegibility uh, isn't always the case with doctors. My daughter-in-law is a doctor. She has perfectly legible writing. Um, I just think a lot of doctors are accused of being illegible, but often the high speed that you get from people who are uh, very intelligent, their mind works very much faster than their hand, and the result is uh, illegible fast speed. But um, by the way, not a bad thing. You know, you look at Beethoven, incredibly fast, illegible stuff, highly creative person. So, um, you know, when you see this messy, fast writing, it's known as high form standard in graphology. And people say, oh, well, my teacher always used to say, 
my writing was appalling. Why do you think it's nice? So there are different ways of looking at writing. There were a couple of people who mentioned that sometimes signatures have both cursive and printed letters in a signature. What does that mean? I, I don't know what the reason for that would be. It may be that um, uh, it depends which part of the signature is being stressed, because if the uh, first part is in capitals, um, it could be the point I'm making about that the first part of the signature is legible and therefore they want to come across as direct, easy to talk to. Um, if the first part is illegible and the, the surname is, is printed, then they may be stressing their surname. And as we've discussed, that means they're more formal. Um, I'd have to look at the writing to see what the total situation is. Yeah, we're, we actually have gone beyond our normal time. Uh, let me ask one more question. Um, what, uh, from Lindy, what does it mean when each letter in the first name is clear, but the last name is not? Well, I mean, there, there again, what they're saying is, call me Jack. Um, don't worry about the fact I'm Smith. And often that can be with women, that you have a lovely Susan with a capital S, and a small Smith. And the Smith can be the married name and Susan can be the first name. And what it's saying is, I have achieved things on my own. I have not been given $10 million by my father. I am not married to an extremely rich person. I am Susan and I've made it on my own. Okay. So it's a very positive thing with women. With men, it could be back to the whole point about um, wanting to be seen as friendly and direct. Wonderful. I want to thank you for a, an outstanding presentation and a uh, very interesting and informative talk. Um, thank you for asking me. I'll say, I'll say goodbye. Thank you so much.